Hello and welcome back to the Wheel Talk Podcast. My name is Abby Mickey. We're here to talk about women's professional road cycling. I'm joined by Gracie Elvin. G'day. I'm going to just continue with the awkward Aussie. Hello. <laughs> I'm just I mean, you just just keep it going. I like that <laughs> Tills pointed that out last week. <laughs> I'm not going to improve on it. Just keep it. <laughs> It's our it's our last fully Australian episode no. before we turn our attention to elsewhere in the world. Yeah. And we also have Matilda Reynolds Tills is back with us this episode. Oh, as the Aussies would say, no, don't go. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> hi team. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for having me back. Uh yeah, just oh it's so nice just to be able to talk women's cycling. So yeah, it's a pleasure. We've got an awesome episode today. We've got to talk about the Deakin University Road Race, Cadells, as it's uh, more commonly known. It was a it was an awesome race, another surprise winner. And I think that's going to be the bulk of the episode. We're just going to dive in. It was another surprise winner. As we talked about last mm. week, it seems like it's always a surprise winner at this race. And again, this year, we had Rosita Reinhout, the 19-year-old on Visma Lisa bike, took the win solo narrowly took the win solo and yeah her first her first win like it's her first (laughs) it's not even her first world tour (laughs) win it's her first win (laughs) so pretty impressive yeah epic like i'm pretty sure she wasn't on anyone's list (laughs) (laughs) yeah Yeah. except her team's list because apparently they were working for her yeah she's such a sweet kid i feel like calling her a kid but i know she's like a, a, a Yeah, a a wonderful, a really strong woman, but she was, um, yeah, I had a bit of time with her on, um, we had this great uh, sort of opening ceremony, a welcome ceremony to the event where they've done it a few years now, but they have, um, yeah, a really good uh, sort of welcome to country. And so I was sort of explaining to the Visma team about uh, the Indigenous culture and where it's at and uh, just giving them the background of why, um, yeah, we're getting smoked out. Uh, which was uh, welcoming to the land. And, um, yeah, just just a really, really nice, uh, yeah, great person, really. She And even in the only time I saw her during the, the race really was, um, oh, she's quite small, but, you know, I, uh, she was trying to get a wheel and I let her have that wheel and she was so grateful. So she's just a very, you know, sweet kid. And I think, but the way she rode that end um, and to have the confidence to go and also the maturity to read the end of the race, um, I think speaks volumes. So, um, yeah, it just as we predicted, a, um, a random, surprise winner um but also not a surprise in in this particular race so uh yeah was, i think it was still a great ending as well yeah i loved her post-race interview when she she was just so dutch and she was like well the race the the, the they were coming back and the race was going and i went like it's just like yeah obviously obviously <laughs> that was the choice that i made was to go where like you had Cecily Utrecht Ludwig, a, a much more experienced rider, kind of holding back at that point. Or she said after the race that she was just cooked um, by the time she was caught by by uh, Reinhardt and Budarczyk caught C- Cecily Utrecht Ludwig. It was um, it was a great move, and I think just highlights how different this race is from something like TDU, how different a one day is from a stage race and also how different a race like this is from pretty much any one day we're going to see in Europe, barring a couple of the random non world tour races in Spain usually end this way. The ones that are over in uh, the Basque region usually have surprise winners, but it's pretty rare that we see a world tour one day race and in such a way which is pretty cool with two basically unknown riders on the on the top two steps but there was plenty of like well-known riders in the race like it was cool this year in both tilt down under and cadells to see probably the best fields ever that we've seen in australia like and depth i guess and very international so yeah it wasn't it wasn't an easy bike race to win <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I guess if we take it back to the start, I think, um, you know, the, the biggest surprise was that Amanda Spratt was not starting. Um, so that was, um, she was the only one not to sign on that day. And then we also knew, um, that Loretta Hansen, uh, was carrying a little bit of sickness as well. She'd, she'd been wearing a mask, uh, at, at the dining table, um, and when she was grabbing her food. So I think as we sort of said last week, you know, we've almost been in this, uh, world to a down under bubble for well over three weeks now where we all have our meals together. We're staying in uni accommodation, both in um, Adelaide and then similar to, um, you know, we stay at the Deakin University, which is, is super nice but and and really good um, food and everything at in Geelong as well. But you're, you pretty much see everyone of the whole peloton every day. So I think a lot of sickness had been starting to go around a little bit. Um, and yeah, it was, so you saw the red pull out just at kilometer zero, um, which gave Trek, I think, what, three riders I think they had there. So they needed four to start. So she had to start. And so that sort of really changed the dynamic because it was quite windy on the day. So we were looking we, if there were going to be a team that was going to split it up, it was going to be Trek, but they just absolutely had no firepower. Um, FDJ sometimes took demand, but it was actually a, some, it was just one of those days where it was like, frustratingly hard and easy so it was like dead roads cross headwind all the time um nothing could really get away one of my teammates in bridge lane tried to go up the road but they just never actually got let off the leash uh they were just dangling in front of us the entire time because it was just too windy no one the whole bunch was nervous the entire day and then we went over the first the first climb um and it's probably the biggest ever bunch that's come back together after that first climb so we made it over and then this, this, you know, to get swamped again by another bunch behind us made the second lap really challenging. And I think personally that's where I really let myself down was just not burning enough matches to get into a good position on the second lap because I was nervous about how the second lap would feel. But the thing is, if you're not in the fight, it doesn't really matter what what's you're doing, you've got to be there. And so for me it was like, like Gracie, you've commentated a few of my races, like, you know, I, I'm up the front too much. Uh, but then when I was trying to be the protected rider, I wasn't in the right position. You know, I was trying to protect myself too much. And we have a team that wasn't able to, you know, rally around, which was, um, you know, we're, we're a lower end Conti team. But the other teams, it's probably the, the most on a second lap where we've had big teams all there doing a big lead out for, for that second lap. So, And there was a headwind, so it was able to stay a little bit together. So for Cecily to punch off the front of that group, it t- would have taken a lot more effort uh, into the headwind. And Cadells, you've just got to be so patient. It's such a patient race in terms of attacking and uh, knowing when to go. And even though the end is quite fast, it's one of those um, finishes where you've got to be really on top of your pedals um, because, you know, everyone's going fast down there. So it can it can come back quite um, quite quickly. But I, am, I think it was evident that Cecily felt like she'd probably lost that race. You know, she um, she was definitely the better rider out of the three, obviously the higher profile name. And, um, yeah, I'm really surprised because I haven't seen the finish, so it was really surprising that, that she was able to punch away. The winner, was able, Rosita, was able to punch away from Cecily, who has such good punch. But as we said last week, a lot of the riders aren't used to this, you know, this uh, going into the red, backing it up, going into the red. Um which was evident when we had the crit on Thursday night. Everyone just found it so hard. I don't know what it looked like from your end, Gracie, but no one got to see it. I was in it, but everyone, I was much better positioned because I was riding for someone else. And, but it was, uh, everyone just hated it. It was so bloody hard. <laughs> and everyone just said, this is way too early in the season for, you know, Eleanor Baxter was just like, this is just, you know, threshold VO2s in January is just, yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of how it was in, in, in the middle of the race, but I'm curious how it looked, uh, looked from the outside. I'll, I'll comment on you first, Matilda. And I just want to <laughs> say, don't feel bad. You got to learn from both sides. I've had to learn from mm. both kinds of experiences of, 
uh, riding too much in the front and then being a bit too conservative when you're protected. So that's another mm. learning opportunity for sure. <laughs> uh, you, and it's it's really tough to like want to burn those matches before a tough section coming up. And that, that took me a while to figure that out in some of those bigger races where you have to like go into the red before you go into the red, mm. kind of. But mentally that's what it feels like. Um, but, yeah, yeah, for the race, um, I wasn't – expecting it to really split up too much i think as commentators we always hype up the crosswinds on this course but i don't think it's really ever split up in like the this is the ninth edition there's opportunities for potential but the sand dunes and the the um the trees and the built-up areas and it just changes direction just a few too many times that it just it's rare to get a good wind direction and strength on that course to have good crosswind action so yeah I think it was definitely down to the laps um and I was surprised that there were wasn't a harder attack on this first time up the climb particularly from Sarah Gigante or someone like that um it did look hard though it looked like they were still setting a pretty tough pace um someone that really impressed me that looked like they were climbing pretty much the best Bar Sile's attack was Ella Wiley. I think she deserves a mention. She was just looking so fresh <laughs> both times up the climb, able to match the the intensity of those sustained efforts and some of the attacks that were happening. But I think Sile's move on that second climb was quite impressive. I, I, I was really enjoying watching her. She looks like she's coming into some really great form. Um, and maybe a good classic season coming up for her. And I I think it it wasn't a bad thing for her to attack there. It was just that there was a cut. It's just that course that if you can still stay within striking distance and if you can just hide a little bit like Ros Rosita did and let other people drag you back, it's not even that next climb that does the difference it's the flat section. Often, like, I've seen heaps of attacks go on that flat straight. I think it's Minerva Road, um, and that's where they go because it, that's where everyone just has that breath and looks around. And for a young rider, I can't speak to her mentality, but I love seeing young riders kind of um, go all in because they don't have that pressure on themselves to – be the winner they just go wow this is the opportunity I gotta go like and as she said it was such a Dutch thing to say in the interview but like that's pure racing and sometimes you get the best results from riders like that that don't have that pressure of like oh but I've got a teammate behind and what what should I do or like she she just raced on instinct and she was able to win she obviously was having a great day physically but it's the other favourites that are looking then at each other and they just don't have enough time to get organised as that fast run into the finish. So it was pretty exciting, though, that last kilometre. The the small chase group behind, Sile and Dominica chasing Rosita and they were so close on the line and you could see that Sile, she did ride, ride that pretty hard, like she went all in to try and win that race and she had to burn every single match there. So I don't think she finished the race thinking she should have done much different. I don't think she was just disappointed that it wasn't the win. And then she let out quite early as well. So she just got pipped on the line and got third instead of second. But yeah, I think she was, she wrote race to win it. And I was happy to see that. Yeah. I think they all, all three race to win it. And I, and I think like major kudos to Ella Wiley, obviously live Alula Jaco was, um, committed to working for her and, and trying to win this race. And Adrian Sharon Sudal was all in for Sarah Gigante in the world tour leaders Jersey. Um, but I think that climb just wasn't long enough for Gigante to make the difference. It's too much of a, one of those classic style poppy climbs for it to be a climb that she can ride away on. Like she did on Wollonga. And so it just wasn't going to go her way. And I think if, if Sila, you know, watching it, um, my husband was like, well, Celia went too early. She should have gone on the shorter climb that comes next. But at that point, perhaps 
she would have been able to follow a move that went on the longer climb, but it's, it's a real gamble when you get that close to the finish. And I think a climb that short, it's less, there's less of a chance that she's going to go solo. So I don't think it was poorly timed. I think it was, it was a great moment to attack. It just didn't go her way that day. And I, and I do think for Sile, like she'll be eyeing the Olympics later in the year. This is not her target for the year. And, and that will be in the back of her head when making efforts like this and thinking about her form right now. I am sh- I think that she's in the perfect position right now, form-wise, that she should be in leading into the classic season with plenty of time to be able to take a break before the Olympics and have those goals on the calendar for her later in the year. If she was riding like out of her mind right now, it would be like, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> it's a bit early. <laughs> I agree that the second climb's too short. I've, I've, I don't think I've, I can't remember in the men's or the women's race that anyone's really been able to get away properly there. It's, it's after that that is the opportunity. Um, I was also wishing that they'd saved Ali, Ali Wollaston as the plan B for AG, and I was surprised they didn't. Um, I actually thought they were until she did that really strong pull into the second time up the climb. And I was like, damn, <laughs> she just like gave everything for Gigante. And, you know, like I definitely always respect an all-in plan. I like when a team can really commit to 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 one goal, but I just don't think that that was the right play for that team that day. Like as you were saying, Abby, it's just – wasn't long enough it's too punchy i'd say um yeah it was a good yeah totally i, I agree i think ali's has isn't loving being in the bunch a lot um so whether she i think track is absolutely on her mind um kimberly lacourt for ag insurance she came in ninth and she got absolutely roasted by the uh jaco lula she like chopped into their lead out on the first <laughs> <laughs> on the first lap um but she was she was looking really good and I think to be able to try to get like that's her first top 10 finish and yeah still very early to the road scene you know she's a mountain biker and from Mauritius and lives in Stellenbosch so um I thought she did really well I think Ella Wiley is going to be fantastic um for the season as you guys just mentioned I think they had to work quite hard to keep her forward in the bunch um you know, Georgie Baker, Alex Manley. Um, and I think when we were talking the Olympics, I think what seeing just in the bunch what's affecting the peloton as well is not so much the road race, but is all, a lot of the roadies who are, track, who are track riders and just what form they're actually in. A lot of them had track camps leading between uh, Tour Down Under and Cadell's and just how that affected their readiness and I think just freshness as well. So it is going to be difficult for some teams, particularly like Jayco who have, um, you know, Amber Pate, Alex Manley, Georgia Baker, who are all extremely, um, you know, valuable members being able to balance them both. And it is a lot harder for the Aussie and Kiwi teams to do that compared to the European teams. And, you know, we were really looking like my beacon who we were following and really backing was Ruby Rose McGannon um, for the day. And she just, what I, I don't think, I don't think she just wasn't a hundred percent. She, she went over and sort of got over as well on that second climb, but honestly just stopped with 5k to go. I don't know if she was, if she was sick or what happened, but you know, she came through our group sort of thing and just couldn't really keep pedaling. So I think it's a lot of pressure on the Aussies during this period. There's a lot going on for them trying to balance family time and, and, you know, the best performance. But I think, it, you know, and, and also I think Jayco put a lot of pressure on themselves to win this and it, it, it just didn't pan out. Um, what I would love is I wish that national our nationals was this weekend. Um, it's so early in the year to be the first weekend, but as you know, they've got they've gotten those two jerseys, so it I know they wanted more, but you know, they take that into the, the next of the year. But it'll be interesting how that affects, yeah, the the UAE tour coming up. Yeah, I don't know how many riders are doubling up on the Aussie calendar and UAE. Um, but, like, for example, uh, Dominika Bluodarczyk, she is currently leading the Women's World Tour now after finishing fifth at TDU. And she already said that she's she's not going to UAE. Her next race is Valencia. And so she would potentially be wearing the purple jersey in Strada Bianchi 
depending on how that goes. Um, but it will be interesting to see like what how the racing shifts between this and UAE. Obviously, UAE is a lot of sprint stages. Last year, we had the the Lorena Weebus mm. v. Charlotte Cool showdown for multiple stages, and then the climbing fiasco that was Elise Longberghini and Guy Riolini. But this year, I I don't know how that will shift with the Olympics. And I know that there's a track World Cup coming up pretty soon after the Aussie block of racing, correct? Yeah, Nations Cup or something. Yeah, is this coming next week, this week? Yeah. Yeah. So that will be that will be interesting to see how that kind of takes those riders out of contention for UAE. Um even though that would be potentially a better prep race for them being more flat stages, but yeah, I think like for for what it did the the Aussie summer of cycling this year, uh, I think it was one of the best that I've seen so far. And mostly because the field was elevated so much from TDU being world tour, more teams coming over for that. Just the level of racing is rising, I feel like globally. And so that's trickling over into the Aussie races, especially obviously TDU and, and Cadell's. And it was great racing. I, I hope that looking at how the races went this year and the opportunity that it kind of hands to younger riders like Gigante, like Reinhardt, like Bludarczyk, like how that's going to impact the teams that the rosters that teams put together going forward for these races, especially next year when it's kind of that post-Olympic lull. I feel like it's going to be such a great opportunity for the Aussie riders and also young riders to kind of get their feet wet. Yeah. Just a couple of other shout outs. I think you put down obviously um, around uh, Ruth Edwards coming in fourth. That would have been a a great relief for, for her, I think. And, um, uh, you, uh, you know, you'd have a lot more background than me on that, um, Abby, what that means to her. But I think it was a great redemption for Grace Brown coming in fifth just after a challenging TDU, Sarah Roy in eighth. And, you know, I found that quite inspiring just because, yeah, she was in the Australian team and a couple, like sort of the two, us and the two Conti teams. And so the Oz team gets pretty roughed around and um, Roy doesn't take any shit. So to seeing her <laughs> up there and just like, I think that's a really good example of just, um, you know, you know, she positioned herself really, really well. Um, and, you know, that I think they rode pretty well for her actually in all of that. And just also a shout out to Neve Bradbury. I'd say she had a, you know, uh, um, I didn't see it, but I knew, I know when she came back on the first lap, her jersey was ripped and she had obviously crashed, um, which are like a terrible timing into that first lap so to then come back and and fight on for 15th I know um yeah she would have been pretty upset to have had that finish but I think just really positive signs for her um European season I think that was a good call out I think she could have definitely gone for a better result but I was really impressed to see how quick she made it back after Mm. a little touchdown like it was um not very far away from the first time up the climb she crashed right near that stadium area which is probably like 3k maybe less before they you start the climb so yeah good good on her (laughs) it's it she would have been pretty down after the race but I think like such good attitude as well obviously crashing Mm. and getting back up quickly it has its own problems but we don't need to go into them today but she seemed okay (laughs) and I think that was yeah really um just shows her character I guess and obviously her form (laughs) how do you guys feel about the the Aussie summer of cycling in the grand scheme of things Tracy Tills Uh, yeah. Oh, well, oh, for me, it's a, you know, it's a slightly different experience. It's the opportunity and just, it's one of the best, it's one of the best months of the year. You know, you, you go into a depression sort of thing when it rolls on, uh, after this. So, um, yeah, I think, I think the thing is the, y- you've just got to be working so hard. You know, I, I, I just finished full-time work and even with that, you, you just, um, the level you need to be training at that, the, the whole level is rising. So it's just like, yes, you're getting better, but that's only moving you with the Peloton as well. So just to sort of, 
stay with the development on it. And I think it's just such great opportunities for, yes, younger riders to come in. Many of them haven't really – they don't they don't need off-season, these kids. They just, you know, they they keep going and um, for new names. And it's always interesting, the names that come out in January, are they, they the same names that are happening in July? But I think it's, it's a really good gelling moment for the teams. You know, they've had three to four weeks together, these, this co- sort of core group. And um, I think for the Aussies – Gracie, you know, it, it, it's it's a hard balance uh, in wanting to do really well and trying to balance the only time you get with all your family and friends as well. Uh, but then also people who are going well in sort of January, Feb are going pretty well in the classics as well, it seems at the moment. So the only, yeah, I'd sh- I, I would just like to circle back to Amanda Spratt. I think she had a very challenging summer and knows that she can't be peaking in January and, you know, she needs to be peaking later in the year. And I think um, the death of Melissa Hoskins was extremely challenging um, for many riders in the peloton this uh, this summer. And I think, you know, we probably throw around the word courage a bit too much in cycling. It's just cycling. But I, I, I think Spratty's ride at Nationals was probably one of the most courageous rides I've seen in terms of how – uh, devastated she was on the start line um, talking about Mel and then, you know, the ride that she put in. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of them will be able to regroup now and then focus on the European season. Yeah, I think I agree with all of that. I think definitely some emotional toll there from the tragic death of Mel. Um, I think the, yeah, it was obviously we've mentioned plenty of times, probably the best international showing in Australia we've probably ever had and I think that really added a great depth to the racing but it seemed as though most people were on a relatively good level um you know I didn't feel like there was this big range between who was super fit and who was just here for training I felt like the whole bunch was you know racing proper and I think that came across really well on screen and for the fans um from a race organizing organizational point of view I think maybe the last few years, but definitely this time around, like we're seeing it in Europe more and more. We saw it at the Tour de France Femme last year, but I definitely felt it. And I, I was, you know, hearing a lot of people in quite high positions in the race organisations in TDU and Cadell's going, okay, like this, this is proper racing now. Like it's not just a women's event, it's a race and people want to come and see it. Um, people want to talk about it. People want to, yeah. I think that they realise that they they have something worth marketing better and I think TDU does a better job, I hate to say, than Cadell's, but I think the race, the product that Cadell's can also produce is really good and we were treated to a really, really good one-day race. And Tills, I would like to get your opinion on maybe just the feeling that you got on the ground with the teams in that it's nice to have a midweek race. I think that was good that they threw that in also for women, but it could have been better. And I think it should be a road race for next year, not a crit. Yeah, I actually sat with the uh, Visit Victoria, who are the um, sort of the major sponsors of this. So it's it's great for both events. So both both Tour Down Under and Cadells are backed by the government. So, you know, that gives mm. it a lot more um, sustainability and, and, and future foundation. So, yeah, and, and I, I was honest with them. They were quite shocked when I said um, I, I would take half the prize money and give us coverage. Um, so that message still hasn't completely gone through just on how important coverage is. What was paying credit was that they um from the gun or well before the gun uh you know they had live coverage half an hour before we started which is rare and that's a massive you know that that's huge so absolutely be celebrated um the crit the crit was a good blowout like but no one saw it you know and it was just it's actually like you're not really racing you're not racing for money and you're not racing for coverage and it's quite dangerous so you know, and there was a crash. There was a crash in the in the final where I was in 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 the sprint, and um, you know, and and you know, Soro Paladin couldn't start the weekend, so that's where it's a bit, you know, the 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 risk versus reward, um, on that. And I, I'll just I know that for them, they those two races, the men's and the women's, came quite late. Like they de- they decided them in like December, like you know, November December. So I think, and I hope that they take their feedback and hopefully are able to do something else with it. But um, 
There is discussion about the Herald Sun tour coming back. Um, so there could be the potential of adding another UCI race uh, to the January calendar, hopefully. So watch this space. Um, but yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you, uh, ask though, because I've gotten to know a lot of the teams and you see them hanging out and all this jazz, is that like how much does a good vibe add to a result? So a team who's got a really good vibe at the moment is obviously EF. Two who's got even a better <laughs> vibe is Corinne Lebecki. And I feel like we're probably <laughs> going to see the best of Corinne. You know, you can just see her characters just being, it was sort of like suffocated previously and now she's just like out being herself. But, but I, I, the teams that did well had a really good vibe. Um, there wasn't a team that, yeah, like oh, definitely AG. Um, I think UAE are pretty fairly together. It can be, um, there's a couple of teams that are a little bit disjointed. You can tell, and there's a few characters that they're not really like, hey, let's all hang out and do TikToks together, uh, which is fun. <laughs> but I'm curious, yeah, how much does a vibe contribute to a good result man it makes all the difference in the world i feel like you can really tell if you're like at tdu and cadell's when everyone's eating together in the same room you can really tell looking at the teams and the tables the night before the race who's going to have a good race tomorrow if you're looking at all the tables and there's like a quiet table and everyone's like on their phones or not talking to each other it's like okay well they're not organized together mentally enough to put it together for a race, it makes such a big difference. Like I remember when I was on United Healthcare, we had a rule, no phones at the table. Like you just, you weren't allowed to have your phone at meals and it made such a big difference. And I tried to carry that over into, into rally when I was on the team and they just wouldn't have it. They were like, no, we're going to, what well, we're going to be on our phones. And I was like, well then like, we're not bonding with each other every meal, which is like a huge opportunity for all of us to come together and sit together and, and, you know, like, become friends and then work together in the race tomorrow. And so it's just, it's a huge, huge difference. I feel like it's, it's really cool to see, like you mentioned UAE for a team like them, that's so international. There's so many different nationalities on that team and for them to bond is, is a, is a huge thing and it makes a massive difference. And then if you have a team like, you know, like human powered health, that's obviously got a little bit more, American, if they're not bonding well together, then it says a lot about, you know, the team that they've put together and, and maybe even the management and how that's affecting the team. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot that you can tell. I wasn't surprised that Visma won, like the way that they've been the, in this past week, uh, and just their togetherness. It's just a, a group of school children just you know <laughs> hanging out yeah we talked about it last yeah. week yeah well they're all yeah. born in the 2000s they all get each other I know. <laughs> <laughs> makes a big difference <laughs> imagine being at the table you wouldn't know what they were talking about i'd feel so oh, yeah. old it's terrifying <laughs> <laughs> poor poor boss oh uh, yeah and she's gonna sit down at that table and just be like what's riz <laughs> what is a tiktok <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 it makes it makes a huge difference i would love to be a fly on the wall at the at the cadells like cadells especially i feel like has such a unique vibe at the the buffet area mm. <laughs> i would yeah. love to be a fly on the wall you could really like you could tell which teams are walking away from this block of racing like with their work cut out for them they have a long way to go and which teams are going into the european season where you know the best of the bonding is behind you you kind of need to have your shit together now before you go into europe because tensions are going to only rise from this point on mm. and if you're already on the outs with your team if your team is already struggling to get along it doesn't look good for the season at this point. Yeah, I just hope for Trek that, you know, obviously like last year their biggest issue was running out of riders and in the first one-day world tour they ran out of riders. So, um, yeah, it'll... I, they must have broken some mirrors or kicked some puppies or yeah. something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 but in saying that they are one of the most together together teams. So, um, yeah, it was it, I, I, their absence certainly certainly changed the dynamic of the day but yeah for any teams and riders listening no phones at the dinner table so 
I'll try to influence it. <laughs> yeah, I like that rule. Yeah. <laughs> it was the best rule. It was such a good rule. I was so bummed on Rally when they were just like, no. And I was like, but guys, <laughs> we need to come up with inside jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the moment. Um, I do want to get rid of just going back to like that purple leader's jersey is just stupid. Like you just, <laughs> when you're in the race as well, it's like, who the fruit is that? Like you just constantly yeah. don't see anyone. And then the other one is just to remember it's the New Zealand champs this weekend. So, um, and Ali Wollaston, she said to me she wasn't racing. So um, someone else will be wearing that. Ella Wiley is is turning up. I'm not sure where Ella Harris is up to. Um, She stayed at home, still struggling from some concussion, I think. I don't think she will be lining up. But, yeah, I don't think it'll be a huge field there. But, yeah, Ali Wollaston will be back in her – her AG insurance kit. I only say that because I totally lost her in the crit. I couldn't find her. I just she wasn't in it. <laughs> you know, Kiwi mm-hmm. crit. I wonder if Neve Fisher Black is racing. I don't think she's back in. I would NZ. love to see her back. Yeah. Shoot, I w- I would love to see her back in that jersey. Yeah. She just so yeah. yeah. I'd, I'm happy to get rid of that leader's jersey. I don't understand it. The men don't have one, do they? They don't have that. No, no they don't. They got rid of that like. <sighs> 20 years ago and I think the only thing I like about it in like right now this particular moment in time is Dominika Blodarczyk she had she she had this awesome quote on the weekend about how you know TV yeah. was her first world tour race and last year she was racing like local races in Poland which have a look at her first cycling and you'll see that she's got she's racked up an impressive number of wins already at UCI races so it's not like this is she's brand new to the scene but her first world tour race was two weeks ago and she's in the the world tour leaders jersey now, yeah which I think is is a kind of cool story but yeah it's it's just I think you can just be presented with it. Nobody understands it. It doesn't make sense. Like, it's yeah. cool to get it. You don't I have think, to wear but it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you have to wear it. Yeah. I was going to say, especially when, like, Demi Vollering is leading it and she's wearing that instead of the Dutch National Champs jersey at the tour. It's like, come on. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. Yeah. One thing that came up over our conversations a few times was, it was like, just totally switching gears. And we, when we're talking about vibes and teams, is we sort of spoke about, you know, Visma's had really big changes, but the other team that's had really big changes, Roland. Israel previously Israel Premier Tech Roland is now just Roland. I, I saw that they were at a team camp. I'm really curious how they're going to go this year because they lost some really strong riders from their team, and I, I'm the, the their recruitment are riders that I don't personally know. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting how they go because we're just like trying to compare jerseys and who's got jerseys you can see and they're sort of one of them now that like they're, they're I, I like their red jersey but yeah just totally tr- change track I, I they're they're gonna be interesting how they stay in the world tour but they could you know could surprise us i'm fully prepared for ef to take their spot in the world tour to be honest mm-hmm. um but i did write my my annual kit review will be out <laughs> this week and um i believe what i said about roland was that it was lazy the jersey yeah. was lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's like the least possible amount of time you could put into a jersey design <laughs> went into rolling it's a club kit um but i was segueing when you were saying with uh you know um uh demi wearing the jersey and um uh you know you obviously wrote such good article about pro time is it coming on board with uh with um sd works and the tour de france effect yeah i think this is such an interesting topic because i the it's something that we've talked about on the podcast before, but obviously like pro time is a partner company of SC work. So it's not a new sponsor coming on and they sponsored the team last year on a smaller capacity, but they are putting more money into SC works this year and becoming a naming sponsor on the Jersey. And they cited the tour de France as the reason for that and how watching the tour de France this year was one of the reasons that they wanted to back the team even more. And it's not the first team that's had that happen. We have EF Education Cannondale, which basically formed because the Tour de France is has come to the women's peloton, uh, an American team. So when they announced that the Tour de France was going to happen, the sponsors of that, the men's team, were like, well, we need to have a women's team. And mm. through a lot of drama and 
uh, uh, one of the longest running American teams in the Peloton folding, we have EF Education Cannondale, but it's there's multiple teams that have had this happen. Human Powered Health have gone all in for their women's team because the Tour de France as well, and they wanted the World Tour license purely because of the Tour de France. So it's the Tour de France effect, and I think with this new influx of money into SC Works, we can safely say that the, the Tour de France effect is happening. I don't know, Gracie, I'm curious what you what you think about this having been to two tours and and also been in the women's peloton oh for sure but i don't know i i feel like we're preaching to the choir and we've been harping on for years about how women's cycling is a good investment so i don't know if i've got much more to add i just have a few personal gripes that as a commentator like some of these team names is too long like just i wish that you could have one naming right sponsor that had to pay more because like we get told a lot by, by teams, not by anyone else, but the teams, you have to say the name in full. And like Team DSM Fermanic Post NL is a good example. I can't say that that quickly, but they don't want us to say just DSM or DSM Fermanic. And it's just like I'm happy to say the sponsors, but like it's it just feels clunky. It doesn't come across that well I don't think and I just think that it's good to have um it's good to have naming jer- naming rights on the jersey but not for the team name um so that's a tricky one because like I want more sponsors to come into the sport especially in women's cycling oh and the other gripe is that if a men's team and a women's team are connected they don't have the same name like the Jayco Alula one gets me every time. It's it's live Alula Jayco for the women, and it's Team Jayco Alula for the men. And mm. I just fuck it up every time when I'm commentating <laughs> that is so because stupid. I'm commentating men's stuff as well. And it's just like just oh. And I say well, I said something. I said FDJ Suez for the men's race yesterday, and it's just like oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gracie, you're the only one that's picking that up on that, and the one sponsorship person sitting in the dark room it, it, trying to. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Most most fans are very forgiving for the commentary team, Definitely. but it, like, but it still point. gets me. I want to do a good but job. The teams are. I want to do a good job for me, and I want to do a good job for the teams and the sponsors because what we do on air is one of the pillars that keeps the sport alive. So it's just like, oh, it's a bit frustrating. But anyway, it's not a problem that I can solve. I just wanted to say it. I needed to get it off my chest. (laughs) It's too bad that you can't have like a similar thing to how we have when we do the written, the written, yeah, pieces where like for the Tour de France Femme, for example, I can't write out Tour de France Femme of X Whipped and every single time I write it. I absolutely love Zwift and everything that they do for women's cycling. But I have to write the very first time I write it, it's Tour de France Femme of X Zwift. And then from then on, it's just Tour de France. And then at a certain point in the article, it just becomes the tour. <laughs> <laughs> because you can't, if you're reading it in your head, it becomes like really overwhelming if every single time you read Tour de France Femme Vex Zwift over and over in an article about the Tour de France Femme Vex Zwift. I've been on that other side of sponsors though. And uh, yeah, Gracie, I, I, I know those those emails and those, you know, I've sent them myself that uh, there was that one mention that they didn't mention, you know, our name. And But I think, you know, as Gracie said, that uh, there's such good points about that. And I just wish, like, ideally we wish we didn't have any brand names at all so we could actually create a culture where you can follow um, you know, the Boston Celtics or the, you know, the White Sox or whatever it is, like, and not actually following these brand names because when they fall away, it sort of takes a little bit of identity of the team that you enjoyed. Um, you know, Visma Lisa bike, if you were to explain that to someone new to the sport and say, oh, my favourite team is Lisa bike, say, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it sounds so <laughs> stupid. Um, I said Yumbo. So- I said Yumbo Visma Lisa bike in commentary oh, on yeah. the weekend. Because it just yeah. came out. <laughs> it's just the start definitely. of the year. To be fair, it's January. Yeah, yeah. definitely. No. But I think um, what's interesting about the SD Works one and just how big the effect is, is that um, I think SD Works is actually only Netherlands based or that it's sort of Belgium, Netherlands. Like it's not a global company when the sport is, you know, it's obviously going to a global audience. I think the biggest thing is that women's sport is still so cheap. 
it is so cheap for brands to get involved in for the return that they get back. Like I think in the women's, uh, well, it, I hate having to say the week because I don't say the men's World Cup, but the women's um, soccer World Cup, they, you know, there was seven time return on investment. And so if the Commonwealth Bank, the the the, te- the brand that sponsors uh, the Matildas, the Australian team, like they're putting in a million dollars and they're getting seven times No, I back. thought you sponsored them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they're inspired by me. But uh, a seven times investment on, on, on that million dollars, like it's – it, the return is great and the investment is still cheap and so but there's still just too many dinosaurs that are pulling the purse strings that don't haven't quite gotten that like the amount of brands that are sponsoring lower level men's teams mid and high level men's teams where if they put some of that loose change into the, the women's invested it into women's they would see such a greater return on that specific investment so we're getting there but we're still a long way to go on that i think Along that, um, along the lines of this conversation, there was actually one other uh, shout out that I wanted to give for for Cadell's, but also for just women cycling in general, and that's Factor Bikes. Like I think in the episode where we picked our dream teams, we we talked about Specialized, we talked about Trek, but one of the brands that's really getting behind the women's Peloton is Factor, and you saw that in Cadell's, they were they were the sole breakaway bike, the sole bike of the breakaway <laughs> between uh, co-op Ripsol, Repsol. Um, they're new to sponsoring that team and also ASA uh, Skip Capital they sponsor. So they were the two bikes in the, the breakaway that was before the laps. And then um, Audrey Cordon Rago on her factor for human powered health was also off the front. And they're, they're just all over the Peloton from, lower level teams up until the world up to the world tour it's pretty cool to see another bike brand like canyon coming in and really putting their money where their mouth is and putting their brand into the peloton and they're all over the peloton this year so um i love that i love to see that yeah it's a good shout yeah yeah and and also putting them on brand new bikes but uh ACA don't have the, the newest version, but still it's a huge investment locally uh, for that because Cervelo is the same with our team. They've got juniors, under 23s, men's and women's uh, elites as well. So it's a huge um, contribution. But yeah, for Factor to put their women's and men's team on unreleased bikes, like that's a huge effort um, to have all those bikes and, and really great paint jobs. So I love that. Um, mm, so, they yeah. were very pretty yeah. in real life. I know this. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And then the other, the other brand, um, Ari, I was going to mention this in regards to the Tour de France effect is that I, I think it's just a really positive sign. Um, obviously in the men's side, we're seeing Red Bull take over some of the Bora team. And, um, I think it's been, cons- you know, they haven't, they only touch sports where they know they can make money. And also a lot of the conversation had been that Red Bull hadn't really gotten fully into cycling because they still weren't weren't sure that it was 100% clean. And so the fact that they have put a huge stake in the ground with uh, the men's team is really exciting. And then obviously, um, you know, uh, Zoe Baxter announcing that she um, has been sponsored by Red Bull, which is very cool. And then, um, but also Blanca Vass, I, I saw on the weekend, I think it's her that, that has that Red Bull helmet at the cycle cross. So um, I think those, they're all really positive steps and positive signs, I think, for the investment and stability of the sport. Mm-hmm. How much do you reckon a Red Bull sponsorship is worth? Like, I'm sure that they're all different for every person, yeah. but like, I'd love to know. I know. I imagine that like Polly and Fran Prevo is pulling in a lot more than Zoe, but it's still like, and Chloe also mm-hmm. with her, she's also sponsored mm-hmm. by, by Red Bull, obviously. But yeah, I'm, I imagine it's a lot. If you look at the amount of money they throw around in other sports. Um, yeah. I'm curious if they're gonna come in, like Bora is one of the teams that doesn't have a women's team attached. No. Yeah, it annoys me because mm. I think they're going to be a really good team, and I yeah. don't mind them either. Is like, no. like I don't love Ineos. I don't think so. Like you no. know, like Bora's got a good really vibe. Supported it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so minus the bullying a- accusations that just got thrown around, but but they got a few Aussies there, so it must with be with the good team. Brooks. Yeah, it's true. So he just and great kits. 
Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, men cycling, Johnny what are we talking Gailey about? And <laughs> Ronan don't know what they're talking about. No, I like it too. I think it looks good and it's easy to spot. Yeah, on the fashion segment, they look way better with the yellow helmet. So then it mixes in. Like, as a rider, one request, like, can I just try to find my own rider in the bunch? That's all I want. Like, if you can see your... Yeah, wait. What's with human-powered health's white helmets? Because at team camp, they had orange helmets. And I am just super uh, disappointed to see them in the races in Australia wearing white helmets. What is this? <laughs> maybe, I want answers. Clashes, maybe they had the to bike. get some Aussie... Uh, some What brand oh. are they? Yeah. Sometimes. That's a good call, That's a good call Gracie. Some, yeah, maybe they're not team helmets. helmets and they just had to get a bunch last minute here. Mm. I don't know. That was be my only guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll see. We'll see at Omloop then, I guess. It's coming up. <laughs> oh, gosh. I can't wait. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> such a good appetizer, I will say that. It's such a good appetizer. I Since we're on the fashion topic, I am going to move into what we're obsessed with. Um, because I posted on my Instagram story, but what I'm obsessed with at the moment is the professional women's hockey league have the, the walk-in where the players are walking into the stadium before the games and the, they like slow it down. They do like the slow-mo walk-in for the players and some players you can tell just go all out and I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. I I'm totally obsessed with the style and also just the idea of kind of highlighting their off the ice uh, personalities a little bit. And I was thinking about who would who would absolutely destroy the walk in for the women. Obviously, we know Demi Mollering has just impeccable style, and Lada Kopecky would probably show up in her loco t shirts. Um, her own her own t-shirt brand <laughs> but who do you guys think would have would have a good walk-in Ooh, that's a good question oh. I would yeah I don't think it would happen because like it's in our contracts that you have to wear your ugly tracksuit pretty much no everywhere. I'm, I'm ignoring that <laughs> I'm ignoring that for the I don't want to see tracksuits I don't want to see team, I'm amazed that team um, ho- hockey players are allowed to do it because I feel like most teams have to wear a team kit everywhere Oh, who would be good? All right, like Corinne's got swagger. She's got some her own little. Oh, yeah. She really does. She's got yeah, some style. Like, obviously, Alison Jackson's entrances. I don't know about her her fashion, but her entrances would be dramatic to say the least. But yeah, there's a couple of sports that do that. I think I would just find that too stressful. I'd love the entrance and like to have my own like entrance music every day. But the stress of having to do like a fashion show, like some of the US soccer players <laughs> do the same thing and the basketballers, like it's, oh, I too, yeah. And so sort of the, the Lionesses, the women's UK soccer team do it pretty well. Like they're still in their team kit, but every day they have like, they sort of play a different song and, um, you know, they all come into that. I would say, I tell you who would be good is the Italian on Trek. Uh, is a, is a. Oh, Ilaria Sanguinetti. Yes. She is like- she would be back. There was a picture that yes. Brody Chapman posted of her tattoo. Mm. Like they're all hugging. And so Ilaria's or Yaya, as I was corrected by my husband, he was like, who's Ilaria? Her name's Yaya. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> um, but she has Olaf, the <laughs> the so snowman funny. from Frozen tattooed on her arm. Like she's, she seems like she's just a lot of fun. Yeah. Here. She's a lot of fun. And like, yeah, I tried to play cricket with her and obviously, yeah, she got over it pretty quickly, but um, she was way too cool for that. <laughs> she was just, she's just very cool. So I think I, I'd, I'd put my money on her. Yeah. And Brady, Brady would be a good sidekick as well. Like she's got some good style. Yeah. I like, she's often rocking something cool from an op shop and she was wearing a Lidl branded bum bag or a fanny pack oh, as yeah. you may. <laughs> Before yeah. the race, like at sign on and I was like. That's good. It was bright yellow, and I wanted her to race with it, but I got her. I got her to twerk a little bit. So thanks, Brady. Good job. That's so true. <laughs> but we all know Tiff Cromwell has the wardrobe for it. Oh yeah. With her Gucci shoes, she would totally just like. It'd almost be unfair. Tiff actually <laughs> does do that. She does the Formula One track walk. So yeah, yeah. it would be unfair. There's like whole Instagram yeah. pages dedicated to her fashion. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is too stressful. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, I would love it. I would absolutely love it. Yeah. I would get so into it. <laughs> uh, anyway, what's what are your guys' obsessions this week to close out the episode? Oh, mine's a bit of a stretch. I think maybe I've been obsessed watching Succession, but that's just because I go through when you like I have big tours or, you know, when I go to Europe for six or eight weeks, I have to find something that has enormous amount of series and like I've done Suits, I've done um, Gossip Girl and now I'm into, you know, over the last few years. But I actually got into the tennis this past weekend. So it was the Australian Open here. It's always a bit of a come down when we finish all of the Aussie cycling and the Australian Open is over as well. But um, talking about style and dancing, Sabalenka, who won the women's um, Open, I actually got, I've I've gotten quite into her because I probably judged her a little bit. She's from, you know, she doesn't have a flag. She's from Belarus and, you know, I, 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 she was so aggressive on the court and she screams, which is a bit annoying, but she actually seems so fun. Like she was just, yeah. And just her story about trying, you know, she never thought she'd win a grand slam and was, you know, lost her father and going to give it all up. And then to come back and win back to back Australian opens is, yeah, it's a really good story. And she's just a really good supporter. There's an amazing commentator um uh as well like a female commentator that's been as Aussie commentator and they've just had really great chemistry on the court and so yeah still women's sport the Aussie the Aussie Open was pretty good I can say I've been obsessed with that and so I got two come downs now nothing's going on <laughs> Gracie how about you oh there's, there's some good ones um well, my my little baby's just started kicking me, so that's pretty cool. What? Um, that's yeah, crazy. I'm just getting a bit obsessed with that. Um, and then I haven't been reading as much the last few weeks, being away at all the races as well. But I've just been binging a bit. I've been more into the opposite details, like a season that's like less than eight episodes. That's like my sweet <laughs> spot at the moment. Just like knock it out. It's I've I've watched a few good ones recently the one I just most recently finished, which it was weird but good if you like kind of odd stuff, but I thought it was really well directed, a story I'd never heard before. You probably have heard it if you are American, but it, the show was called Angeline and it was uh, it was fictionalised but based on a true story of this woman that was famous for being famous before that was a thing. So this was back in the 80s in LA in Hollywood and it was she's played by Emmy Rossum who I used to love in Shameless and a number of other things but she was actually really good in this role, very unrecognisable. And, yeah, it was, it was only five episodes of 45 minutes and it was just eye, eye candy but also a bit, quirky and actually quite clever in a few ways so yeah i'd recommend that if you just want an easy quick watch <laughs> gracie i always find you've got like quite intelligent recommendations <laughs> like like you've got really good like you know like just yeah if i was to go to a dinner party and i needed to impress people with my intelligence i need to call you up rather than being so basic bitch saying gossip girl <laughs> oh don't worry kimberly and i just started the oc like uh, we have a shit show going a always. Yes, like we, yeah. we still haven't finished Charmed, but we're like, let's start the OC. Oh, yeah, no. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to have like good shows and shit shows because you just your brain just wants a little break sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you, you just need something playing. Yeah, yep. yeah. So you can scroll on your phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks you both so much for, for chatting Women Cycling with me. Tills, thanks for joining us again. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, team. And yeah, we'll be back next week. Classics are coming. UAE Tour is uh, the 8th through the 11th, but check out the Wheel Talk newsletter for more information about that. And as always, let us know your thoughts on the Discord. We're all there. Włodarczyk. So it's Dominika Włodarczyk. Włodarczyk.